Ghost of Tsushima is a multi-layered gem that understands how to grab a player's attention. It starts off in a pivotal moment for the residents of the island, full of fear and overwhelming death. Within the first hour, the player understands the opposing threat on a personal level, gets a grasp on who the protagonist is, and after navigating through all the danger, freely rides a horse into the contrastingly beautiful open world with an overarching goal in mind. The strong introduction kicks off this breathtaking masterpiece. Throughout its journey, I enjoyed the game for its fulfilling combat system that allows for great flexibility, and, at the same time, it encompasses moments of blissful mental wellness. It was one of the most gratifying games I've ever played. Now let's shift our focus to the game Minecraft Dungeons. I completed the game once, and the only reason I did is because of the social pressure I had to finish it with a friend, and my distaste for leaving things unfinished. It's a good game for what it is, but it was not an experience that stuck with me. Today, we're talking satisfaction. Most game developers, especially those of the modern era, want their content to be as satisfying as possible. That way, players receive their hits of dopamine and have a pleasurable experience. These dopamine hits will be packaged in a variety of different forms for the player. Sometimes it's given out through the form of challenges. It used to be in the form of a loot box, but now it's more in the shape of a battle pass. Regardless, they all contain the same thing. Rewards and positive feedback. In the game space, a reward is like a carrot on a stick to a pig. Players are the piggies in this situation, and will run until the game developer cuts the carrot loose for us to enjoy. What that carrot is differs greatly. Sometimes a game's controls feel so right that that in itself brings satisfaction. Even when a game is particularly tough, an excellent control scheme can make it fair. Depending on the game, even new opportunities can open up by mastering movement, and immersion can be enhanced through this responsiveness. It has the potential to elevate a game to new heights and make it memorable with a unique but effective control scheme, so it stands out in the sea of art. This is one of those many carrots. A great example is the satisfaction from swinging around in Insomniac Spider-Man games. Many players use the installments as if they are web-swinging simulators. I have friends who do this, and I understand entirely. It's not just good, it's therapeutic. In Super Mario Galaxy, I feel this satisfaction too. I've played the game over and over again since I was seven, so when moving around, I feel a sense of satisfaction. I know that I am going to land where I want to land, and that what I picture myself doing in my brain is what will actually come to fruition. With the game's cousin Super Mario Sunshine, however, I have far less experience with that control scheme, therefore I am more prone to frustration and getting myself killed. But then I wonder, does experience coincide with pleasure? A common trend found with games is that experience equals satisfaction. This sentiment mainly applies to older titles, especially those that have remained relevant through multiple console generations. These timeless games hold up so well that, for some, it could be looked upon as the pinnacle of the video game media. GTA 6 is one of those games for me. Yes, this is me with my copy of GTA 6 for the PS4. Oh my god! I've been playing this game for nine years now, and I know what there is to expect. I know what driving the cars in this game feels like, and I enjoy it. I know what the gunplay feels like, and I am familiar with all the possible maneuvers. And I know, or at least am very confident, that what I am doing is the best way of doing things. I am the top dog, therefore I am satisfied. But in very special games, the opposite is also true. In The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, you are thrown into a vast open world, with any direction for you to go in, and when put into harsh circumstances, there's the capability of handling it as you please. Here we have a group of Bokoblins. Er, Bokoblins? What is it? Bokoblin, I was right. You come across a camp of threatening Bokoblins and wish to kill them. Everything in my arsenal is an option. I have bows and arrows, I have melee weapons, I have my magical abilities, and I even have the world around me to my advantage. 
but I still don't technically know the best or most efficient way of going about this. There's probably some really crazy, dramatically quick succession of different magical powers that would get this done most efficiently, but you know what? I think it'll be the most fun to kill them with this boulder, so let me do that. Yeah, that was fun. It was easy, I watched a badass explosion, and now I feel satisfied for doing it my way. Difficulty modes, harder difficulties in particular, have the potential to grant the player great satisfaction after being accomplished. Cuphead is a wonderful example of this type of satisfaction. Not only is it an enjoyable game that is jaw-dropping to look at, but it is hard typically considered the dark souls of platformers. I have spent entire nights on some of the bosses of this game, and it was stressful alright. It drove me freaking insane. But I enjoyed myself, and I knew I was learning the more I played. So when I finally got to the last phase and defeated her, I was satisfied. The only issue with this style of video games is that some are so difficult that it's a turnoff. Many people will find themselves trying a well-known difficult game, and after some time spent, we'll say, screw this, this sucks, and I can't even blame them, because I've been there. Many view video games as a source of relaxation. After a long day of school or an 11-hour shift, it's nice to just zone out in a calming world. But I've also found myself in front of games that are ridiculously easy that I end up speeding through. And when this low level of difficulty is accompanied by a family-friendly aesthetic, I may say to myself, Damn, maybe I'm not the target demographic for this. Sometimes, dare I say it, violence in video games can bring great satisfaction. You're having a tough fight against an opponent in Mortal Kombat, and just barely manage to come out victorious. So now you get the privilege of performing a fatality, harming your opponent so badly that they, uh, won't be an issue any longer. With satisfying video game violence, I think of the Doom series as well getting right up in the face of enemies and eliminating them with a hearty blow. This violence is dramatic, over the top to say the least, but it's another legitimate form of satisfaction. In its many forms, it contributes to a sense of power like no other. Sometimes the violence is even used in a way to make it more realistic, upping the stakes and reminding the player how morally flawed our actions may be. Or sometimes violence can be so ridiculous that it's funny. Best way to make a man talk to stop him being able to talk. <laughs> Armed weaponry and explosives are extreme and would be intimidating in real life, but in here, there's a beauty to the chaos. However, a satisfaction that is less beautiful, a kind I urge everyone to stay away from, is the checking it off the list type of satisfaction. Many years ago on my phone, I had a list that looked something like this. This is f***ing stupid. In this context, I'm looking at these games as if it's a to-do list for chores. No one should be pressuring themselves to play titles that they are not interested in. Don't get me wrong, trying new games is the best way to expand one's palette, but the precious time we spend with them should be through ones we absolutely love, or ones that are enjoyed with good friends. Time should not be wasted unenthusiastically playing a game just to check it off a list. Now, roguelikes are a special kind of satisfaction carrot. It's also one that is growing steadfast, easing itself into the mainstream through fantastic contributions to the genre. And whether it's in the style of a colorful bullet hell arcade game, or a captivating card game surrounded with mystery, most roguelikes go like this. You begin for the first time and everything is new to you. As you play, you pick up on how everything works, and you might die a few times, but that's okay, because you'll return to the front doorstep with all your known knowledge. Then you pick up on your preferences, figure out your playstyle, and before you even know it, you'll reach the end. It's an enriching formula that works. It contributes to the sense of replayability, and of course, satisfaction. It also doesn't hurt when the roguelike rewards the player for all their effort with permanent cosmetics, and new characters. The genre is filled with good fun that is mechanically very satisfying. But as cheesy as it is to say, nothing will ever be more satisfying than the great memories made playing awesome games. 
Both Breath of the Wild and Animal Crossing accompanied me during the pandemic and gave me fun objectives to focus on while I was cooped up and bored as hell. I haven't touched Animal Crossing in a fat minute, but I'll never forget the hours of enjoyment it granted me. This sentiment only grows stronger when reminiscing about the time spent with my closest friends through online multiplayer. It was the birthplace of many inside jokes and my closest friendships. So to me, these games are genuinely priceless, and I am so grateful that they existed at all. These were the best social spaces to be in when it was a cold rainy day or one in the morning, and it was also a prominent social landscape to spend time in along friends I wouldn't typically see on a regular basis. Life is bigger and better now, but what a blessing it was to be a kid enjoying some solid ass games. Satisfaction is not only a feeling that should be related to video games, it should be the entire point. Whether it's something on the cozy side or the violent side, all games are capable of bringing out the positive emotions from within. I think that everyone has a comfort game that brings them consistent joy, and that's worth cherishing. The variety of great games out in the marketplace nowadays is outstanding. It could be genuine art related to the online space, or a strong narrative. But when logging off for the day, one sentiment should remain relevant. That was worth my time.